And we are live on YouTube. Oh, what did you have for lunch? <laughs> We have, we have some trick questions like, uh, what is Lily's coffee name? I don't know Lily's coffee name. Oh. <laughs> or Starbucks. Not Starbucks. <laughs> I think we're ready. All right. Are we good to go? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. You guys have made it this far. First day of DevConf. That's pretty good. Uh, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about the impact of AI. And we have with us Jared, Uli, and Daniel. And they will be our panelists. I am Sherard Griffin, the moderator. I'm here to keep these guys honest and make sure that they tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. So first off, we're going to do some introductions. Uh, Jared, maybe you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. I'm Jared Floyd. Is your microphone on? I think so. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll move it a little higher. There we go. Uh, yeah, I'm Jared Floyd. I'm uh, in the office of CTO uh, working on technology strategy. Yeah, Uli Drepper work uh, also for the CTO, Chris Wright. Uh, no one knows what I'm doing, so I'm mostly looking at all kinds of compute things. Among them uh, is machine learning. Daniel Rieck, also Office of CTO, and um, I manage the AI Center of Excellence, uh, working on Red Hat's AI strategy. So we're going to start off with a uh, pretty generic question to get the ball rolling. Uh, what do we think about the impact of AI as it deals with software development, IT operations, DevOps, those types of things? So I'm curious, uh, Daniel, what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, well, I think that overall AI is, is this big transformation, and um, in the, the, you know, many of the shiny topics that we we see in media, like self-driving cars and all that, are, are like hard problems to solve, and there are a lot of low-hanging fruits for um, applying machine learning to improve um, IT itself software development operations, um, embedding AI capabilities, machine learning capabilities in uh, software um, products and the platforms. And you know, it's the, the picture I used earlier, if you're driving a self-driving car, uh, you probably don't want a sysadmin in the trunk. But that, that car is basically a data center on wheels. Right? So in, in order to get to that, you want to automate things to a degree beyond what we have done so far with IT. And I think that applies like generally to what we do with, with software. Jared, in your line of work, what do you think uh, the impact of AI will be? Uh, well, AI is interesting because it covers a lot of traditional analytics as well as machine learning techniques. And um, I think I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later on, but I think that uh, there's a very interesting set of patterns of newer applications that are built around data flows uh, and bringing data into the system, doing some sort of processing in it, which may include AI processes, and then taking action on that. And that may be taking action locally, or that may be taking action at a different point. So Daniel just talked about autonomous driving as an example. Autonomous driving has the full suite of AI ML techniques in, at play, but most of those aren't happening on the car. They're happening in a training process that's happening uh, in a very large data center infrastructure. So there's flow that's, hap that's, that's occurring where data is coming in from vehicles for asynchronous training purposes. It's being analyzed. Uh, and then that's creating updates that, uh, that are then delivered, again, asynchronously to the vehicle to improve its behavior. So managing how that data flow happens, managing um, the, the security of that data flow, the reliability of that overall application process, um, the, uh, you know, the general assurance that it's doing the right thing is going to be interesting because that same pattern occurs across use cases such as uh, IoT, Internet of Things, another kind of large, vague, but uh, uh, complex area uh, use cases as well. So overall, I think we're going to see a shift to these data-centric applications of which AI is a core component for doing analysis. So when you mentioned about security and, and things like that, do you see a place in AI to maybe mitigate the risk for businesses or at least expose potential issues? Hmm. Uh, I think from a security perspective, in that case, I was talking more about um, making sure that you have 
templates for what your application lifecycle is so that you know that you've done appropriate integration testing, you know you've done appropriate regression testing before you put something in what can be a safety critical situation. Um, AI techniques also can apply for uh, security use cases. Uh, we just had a talk uh, two sessions ago about using AI techniques for anomaly uh, detection or intrusion detection, all the things that we've traditionally built rules-based systems around, um, but that AI techniques allow us to create much more flexible, uh, much more reactive environments. Cool. All right. Now, given that Linux is you know, the biggest open source operating system. Um, what's interesting is there's a lot of Linux developers out there now. Uh, Uli, can you kind of speak to what you think AI means to a Linux and a systems developer and how that might change their paradigm or change their approach to development? So I don't necessarily think this is limited to Linux developers, but there are big opportunities when it comes to to developing any kind of complex uh, system nowadays where we reach the point that an individual is not actually able to understand every single aspect of this. It's not able to understand the signals which a system can actually bring out and recognize it as something positive or negative or something like this. And therefore, uh, and also, even if they sometimes recognize them, they might be biased in a certain direction that they actually don't want to recognize the signal as being something good, something bad, or something in between, and so on. And getting mathematical logic in place to uh, to do this kind of work, to do the analysis of the work, uh, will open up completely new venues. So, just to give you an example. Um, also, a couple of, I, I gave earlier today a talk on microarchitecture of CPUs and so on. So this is something which, I, if I would uh, fill a room with 100 people and throw a stone, I probably uh, could not hit a single one who actually knows anything about these kind of things like microarchitecture. This is a very esoteric topic, but at the same time, if anyone who wants to do performance analysis using today's uh, uh, performance counters which are available in the CPU, you cannot do anything without actually understanding what they mean. So, but with uh, some, if we're writing some logic, uh, some mathematical logic around the analysis, we can actually learn what makes up, what measurements actually describe a good workload as opposed to a bad workload, and have the AI actually learn this kind of things without the user actually able to describe what makes it good or bad. So we can learn from the systems uh, directly and circumvent the lack of understanding which the uh, which the user might not have or the program might not have, and this extends, as I said, beyond just the Linux world, so it, it's for everyone Some, a big advantage going forward. We just have to build these kind of systems. Okay. Daniel, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Well, I think this, um, it's a, uh, what you see is this general pattern that we can use AI, broadly sense is a buzzword, um, to derive knowledge directly from data. We have the ability to generate a whole lot of data now. Um, the complexity of our systems are beyond the capability of humans to understand. And um, AI can help us make sense of things or it can autonomously derive meaningful information from this very complex set of vectors and amount of data, right? It's, so the problem with the data is it's, it's the, the volume but also the complexity of data. Um, that just beyond like what anyone can still grasp as a human, you, you just have a limit on how how many vectors can you consider when trying to understand what is like what's the root cause for a problem, and a machine can help us. And, do that. Yeah, and the other aspect is that something which has been worked on also is some of the tasks are mundane. This is, and therefore, programmers are not likely to take them up voluntarily. So monitoring a CI system of some sort or recognizing very simple faults like, well, yeah, you didn't commit this message, this, this, uh, this check-in here, and so on. It's missing something. So this is done, and Sherrod can talk about this as well. So it's done using work using bots, oftentimes in some form, where simple tasks might not be even have to be handled by humans anymore. And therefore, we get much more reliable systems because these kind of mistakes, if they pop up, can be very quickly uh, rectified. 
So with the automation, it sounds like a little bit of the, you know, removing the manual tasks that a person might have to do. Uh, do Have you guys experienced any of those examples of things maybe we're doing in Red Hat in that space or, or other tools where you've seen a good job of it eliminating that manual mundane task? I've certainly interacted just on, uh, I, I don't know the, the project or product, but I've interacted on GitHub projects where I've reported bugs and immediately had a bot come back with, you might find these other ones relevant. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple conceptual piece of code, but actually having it produce useful results was enormously helpful. Right. And uh, yeah, we have examples like that, that um, we're uh, in you know, flake analysis and CI, for example. Um, where you, uh, it tells you if there's like somewhere deep in the in, in, in the many aspects of like how a system can fail. They look they look random to a human observer because you don't see the depth of you know it was like on a full moon and was some, someone tortured a black Schrödinger's cat on on, on the graveyard. Uh, and you don't you don't know that, but but it's somewhere in the log and in the in the metrics of the of the cluster where you run run your test. And after it happened five times, you know there's a pattern there because somewhere deep in the vectors of the of, of the data, it's it's a clustering of issues, and so the system can identify that that's actually not a flake. There is a problem somewhere hidden deep in the code that, as a human, it just doesn't happen often enough, or it's too hard to understand. What happens. And we we have that today. Day, it's improving our quality as we speak. Yes, Although phase of moon is not a common build contingent. <laughs> You, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you would be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, to the other end, this is actually also an interesting thing where we need some work, quite a lot of research going on. Most of the works in machine learning nowadays are built on the law of large numbers where uh, you need statistics to actually get a relevant result. So what is going on uh, to some extent nowadays and will be hopefully the focus of more work is that we actually can work with very small data sets and derive patterns out of that in a reliable way. So the thing which uh, Daniel mentioned that we might get to the same error situation uh, five times and the sixth time we can actually deduce something about this ahead of time. That's very, very useful. And we are trying to do some, some work in that area. So I have my personal help on that kind of thing to do the math for me. And uh, yeah, that, I'm looking forward to actually getting results in that area. Jared, I want to go back to something Daniel mentioned earlier, and that was part of his uh, presentation earlier about data being the differentiator. Uh, you know, having all of this information, all of this data, the way you use it, how you make it available, both internally and externally to your team. Uh, so, how do you see with data being the differentiator? What does that mean in the AI space, and, and how does that impact AI in general? Uh, oh, that, that's a very interesting question. I hopefully can give an answer that won't get me into trouble. Uh, so uh, one thing that's very important about not just AI, but AI is really driving this, is uh, driving value further up the stack. We've already driven value from lower level software to higher level application infrastructures. What AI techniques do is that they drive value from your AI infrastructure to the data, to the models that you're building with that data. And so this can be very, you know, very challenging because um, you can ship software that's open source software, uh, which is fully capable of solving a particular problem and may even have the hooks, you know, the input and output hooks to solve a particular problem. But if you don't ship that with a working model, then the software itself is useless. And if you don't ship it with the data to train that model, then, uh, then you'll be limited potentially in what, uh, what an open source user can do to enhance that. Uh, similarly, shipping a model in and of itself can be challenging because it depends um, on what data has been used to, to train that model, that if that's confidential proprietary data, uh, your model can potentially leak information that you don't want to be leaking. So I think that, that as ML grows in importance in the open source community, that there are going to be some very interesting conversations about what license do we make these models available under? What about the data sets? Do we have open repositories for the data sets and the models that are training uh, these newly critical systems? And uh, a lot of the discussions that we had many years ago around licensing and software, we're going to have to have those same conversations 
again, as it comes to the data and the models in ML-based uh, products, uh, that you know, certainly there are data licenses that exist, there are content licenses that exist, they may or may not be appropriate for these particular types of data, or it may not be um, nuanced enough to describe the variance in licensing that we may want to allow. That's interesting. Um, Daniel, what are your thoughts about the difference between open source data and these closed off black box systems? Obviously, you have someone like an Amazon or a Google where they've collected all of their own data, therefore they have the power with their own algorithms. But as you mentioned earlier, that's a little bit different with open source. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit more? Well, it's uh, there are two sides to this. I think that for a lot of things where we're going to use AI, we need open source even more than we need to do with the like, pure software. So the, like, the difference here is that traditionally we have, it's all about code, right? We, we are in a, we're code-centric. And it, the, 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 the source code is complete and describes the functionality of the software. Um, with ML, suddenly you need the data to describe the full functionality, or the training data to describe the full functionality, and depending on what you're doing, like that might change like when you're running the software. Um, the one problem is that if you know if, if if you have a machine that derives information, draws conclusions directly from data, takes takes action based on that. There is no human in between anymore. I, I think that even more you know, drives a, a need for transparency that, that only open source can provide. And so that's one aspect of this. Um, trusting a black box service is, is getting harder and harder. You're more, like, you're more you know, knowledge or you know, intelligence, because that's like in there. So more intelligence is in is in that service. And then on the other hand, yeah, well, I, I think what Jared said, and I, I'll be curious what what Uli's perspective is on that. You know, when you know, open source versus AI, and, and like, how do we keep that consistent? We've, we've, got a, we've reached kind of a detente with uh, firmware blobs, which are opaque binary data that's necessary to have a system operate. Yeah. But I don't think that we can stay static with that same level of acceptance as ML models become more critical to pieces of software that we're using. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the data aspect is certainly so it makes up part of the solution. So that beyond, so David Daniel mentioned also the implementation. The implementation is uh, important as well, so that it is actually freely available and can be inspected because these these uh, the software which are built for for modeling, let's say a deep neural network or even other uh, other techniques and so on, they. Uh, well, why would you trust them actually to do something? So that could be hidden somewhere in there. If the user is weak, then spit out a thousand dollars. Otherwise, zero. So I could, I could hide this in there. So it has to be inspectable. And this also means that uh, for the data itself, even if the implementation is right and someone is delivering the, the trained model with it, it has to be replicatable. So in machine learning, really is nothing but. Um, um, I, but the scientific process actually put in reality for everyone to use. And uh, one of the big aspects in science is that you have to design an experiment and make it reproducible. Yeah. Because otherwise, no one is trusting this. And the same will now be true for every single program out there. And therefore, we have, like uh, Jared mentioned at some point, we have to think about how we're delivering models along with this, but also the description. So things like uh, notebooks, which have been available for a long time, so Mathematica was programs like this had them forever. Uh, notebooks are going to be the way how you actually describe how you arrived at the state that your model is right now, and then people can say, oh, yeah, I see this, I can replicate this, and therefore I can trust the service. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the so so firmware is 
it's a compromise that people are willing to make because hardware is proprietary, like hardware is physical, right? So it's it's somehow an anchor to the to something proprietary historically, which is changing, right? And like I wouldn't say firmware is trusted. So just look at Intel's. Uh, no, it's not I didn't say it's so trusted. People, it's only good. Yeah, people dealt with it. Like, we, you know. but we're actively working to do away with this right. stuff. So we, 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 also, we, lack, we lack the ability to be introspective to audit the hardware that we run on to the same extent the right. software. So I think I think Daniel is saying that that the firmware is abstracted into the same level that I I don't decap my CPU and uh, use a scanning electron microscope to validate that it's doing what it says it does. And there could be all sorts of malicious things yeah, which, happening. But it, no, but I think by like at the point where whole operating systems are embedded in the CPU, and like and, and, and not the best operating systems, right? Like. I think it, was it Minix is Minix. obsolete or something. Was the well, the version which they <laughs> use worth many versions behind. Yeah. So, uh, like at that point, I think like I I, I think you know it's it, it's probably it's a, it's a bit of a different version, but it's time for open source hardware, and then we're getting there, right? Anyway, like, so that, that's another thing. So yeah. we're working on that as well. And and, and ultimately, like in the same, like the more. The more autonomy machines get, the more important this is going to be. Yes. Right? Because we, uh, the yeah. more they take over, the more we have to trust them. So, and and that that becomes a very fundamental question for a, you know, business for for society. Well, and I think there's a very related security issue that that you raise. Um, that goes back to the training data for models and the necessity to have that be replicatable in an open source mm -hmm. product. Because one of the big challenges with, uh, with machine learning systems is that the ability to be introspective into the reasons why they make the decisions they do is a much uh, younger area of research than the learning models themselves. And so to be able to one ask you know, on what basis were these decisions made, and also to make sure that there isn't a, a Trojan horse in the model that, as, uh, as Uli suggested, if you're the right person, then you can take all the money out of the ATM because it has an ML model deciding uh, what it should give you, uh, which is not a very good use case for, uh, for ML. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so talked a lot about the hardware part of it and the latter part, and the hardware versus software. What about software in terms of um, uh, the data versus the source code? When we start to talk about the entanglement of needing to have enough data for the algorithms, but then also having to have the right algorithms that can analyze the data. Daniel, what are your thoughts on that? That's a very, very broad question. Yeah, so no, but the main thing is there. Um, Data science, machine learning, AI, some people call it, I don't know why, um, is not something which you should think you know, know you can apply if you just know that, oh yeah, I can call this library and be done. So you have to think about a model as it is produced by a machine learning algorithm like a function. So if you put in good data, you get good results out perhaps. But you put in garbage, you get garbage out. So how do you to be able to successfully use any of the machine learning techniques, you have to be able to uh, distinguish between the model being garbage or not. And that's not that easy. So this is actually something which requires you to understand what the math is, you know what the weaknesses of the various techniques are, etc. So th this is not not as easy. There will never be black boxes where you can say, well, here's my data, do something with it, and in the end, well, it will work always. That's never going to be the case, in my opinion. And uh, therefore, you have to be careful with what you actually do and uh, who is actually doing the work. So uh, again, so anyone can produce a model, but whether the model is useful, yeah, that depends on lots of quality factors. Do you see that as a challenge for organizations? Uh, maybe Jared, I don't know if you've uh, come across this, but. Uh, Companies want to move towards AI and ML, and they implement these, but it does seem to require quite a bit of work to tune, fine-tune, get the feedback from whatever service is being used, and, and make sure that that model is accurate. Are companies prepared for the workload that it takes to actually tune these models on an ongoing basis? Uh, well, I think what Uli was getting at was actually just a microcosm of software development as a whole, which is that 
Uh, many businesses are very poor at understanding what software they want to develop, and therefore the software that they produce doesn't do what they want. Um, that that uh, we, we don't have the ability to open up a, a text buffer and uh, write a short description of what the software should do and have a system automatically generated. And, and as Uli points out, we, we never will because uh, half of the hard part of software, or at least a large percentage of it, is deciding and determining what it's supposed to look like in the first place. That, uh, uh, I'm not suggesting that the right way to go about this is the, the big design up front, multi-thousand page specifications. Uh, but understanding you know, what problems you're trying to solve are critical to selecting the tools you're going to use to solve them, uh, validating that you're solving the correct problems, uh, or validating that you're solving the problems you've set out to solve, and then deploying that software. So uh, AI and ML techniques are, are just uh, another set of tools in the box for solving uh, business problems, personal problems, educational problems, uh, societal problems uh, that, that we want to influence with, with systems. And so in the business framework, you have to know what your problem is before you know what tools to solve it, uh, you're going to use to solve it, and you have to know what those tools are capable of before you can select them. And so there's a whole spectrum of tools for data analysis from tr traditional statistical techniques, which is a lot of what these, these uh, data science workbench products allow you to work with, to the newer ML techniques where it largely comes down to, you know, again, knowing what problem you're trying to solve. Can you clearly define the inputs and the outputs that you want out of your process, whether it's statistical or ML? If you can't, then you need to go back and figure that out because none of the tools are going to solve the problem for you. Um, and then it's simply a matter of selecting, is this something where, when looking at the problem, um, can, I, can I describe what the rules look like? You know, is, is it that there's a very large space of uh, possible input scenarios, but I have a very easy way of describing uh, what rules apply for what actions I want to take, then a neural network isn't the right tool necessarily, that there are other rules-based systems that you could use. On the other hand, is it really easy for me to create a huge set of example data that I can feed into an algorithm where I can define very clearly uh, 10 or 100 or 1,000 parameters from that input data set where I can clearly define what outputs I want, but it's really hard for me to describe in relation to those inputs what rules need to be applied. That's where uh, more machine learning and uh, recurring neural network approach makes sense. So these are all tools that you have, and yes, lots of people are using them wrong, and lots of people are using them because they're buzzwords. Um, you know, we can have our AI, uh, uh, AI IoT blockchain talk after this. We can uh, <laughs> file for an IPO for our uh, startup that's going to do blockchain neural networks. But, I mean, uh, can you do that with blockchain? I think you can do it all with blockchain. That's my understanding. Is that blockchain I mean the IPO or uh, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, ICO. ICO. Sorry, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, ICO. We'll, we'll do an ICO for our, our uh, AI IoT uh, yeah. blockchain startup afterwards. And, and, uh, and uh, we've used all the right tools in all the wrong ways. There so, we go. So there's, there's one other thing, and this is confusing many people who don't necessarily have the insight in there. So oftentimes um, people are using machine learning, especially the uh, deep, uh, deep learning and deep, deep neural network learning mechanisms in what is called unsupervised learning situations. So this is the entire business model of the likes of Google or Facebook, etc. So they are trying to learn in an unsupervised way with massive amounts of data something about you. They don't actually know about what it is. They are look, just looking at similarities of some sort and so on. So in a completely unsupervised way. So there's no human doing an intervention. So why does it work? Why do I say, well, this doesn't work in general? Why does it work for them? The reason is simply that the impact of them getting the model wrong is that you are seeing an ad which you don't like. Hmm. Big whoop. Who cares? If, on the other hand, you are doing these kind of things and you're writing some piece of software which decides whether to shut down the cooling in, in, in a nuclear reactor, guess what? It's a little bit more important and you don't want to have this. So there's, there's a large spectrum, of course, in the middle, but I would argue that 
pretty much everyone who has to be taken serious doesn't have the freedom to just ignore the quality of the model. So most of the time, you really want to have something which is uh, which is really solid in its results. So in my previous life, I worked for a financial company and so on, and there they could not do these kind of things automatically because the result might have been that you're losing a couple of hundred million dollars. So that's not doable. It's not just human life which might be at stake. And therefore, I would really argue that um, these these. Uh, nice-looking prospects of machine learning, which come from the use of, uh, of unsupervised learning, might be good for things like marketing, etc., for answering these kind of things, but pretty much no other area of life where you actually depend on the result. All right, so we're just about out of time. Do we have time for any questions? Okay, so we'll take a couple of questions. Anyone have any questions? Sure, over there. You have another mic? Okay. Just, just a second, take that come with the mic. Hi, hello. Uh, I just wanted to know your views about AI and gaming, where the AI interacts with human constantly and there is a lot of criticism which is involved. You understand? AI and gaming. I wanted to know your views about AI and gaming. Gaming. Oh, yeah. Gaming. Oh. Uh, uh, so I did, Who's a gamer here? <laughs> no. So I, I did write. So I did write my own games for a long, long, long time. And what we call the AI back then doesn't really compare to what it is today. So um, it's certain. Um, but I think you are mostly referring to the open AI and so on, trying to solve games uh, using AI and so on. This, this is a completely different thing. So they, they're using this mostly because it can be done 100% inside the computer without tiring anyone out. This is just an example for a solution where the input is not a binary one, zero, and so on. It's visual input. So in theory, so uh, there, in, in there, there's, a, there's a similar experiment where you can actually, if you uh, own a GTA license, you can actually uh, write, write your own uh, driving simulator using GTA on a, on a machine because it then just does a screen grab which would be the equivalent of a, of a camera which you have on the windshield. So that's the only thing why these, these companies are using games for that because it provides something where they can cheaply create situations with very uh, extensively complicated inputs and, and trying to write something which we thought we couldn't do before in this sense. So that it's games is beside the point. This is just a coincidence. Great. I think we're just about out of time here. I uh, want to thank the panelists for joining us. And uh, they did say you get a special door prize if you guess who's been at Red Hat the longest. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you.